All right. I have a lot of things to say about McGonagall, so I'm just going to steal this extra two minutes. Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, I'm Kate Glassman um, from St. Catherine University and St. Paul Academy. I teach middle school as well as undergraduate college, um, and I'm going to be talking to you today about McGonagall, and that's even coming from a, a devout Slytherin myself. Um, but irascible and inflexible, perhaps, but always dependably solidly present is our dear friend McGonagall. So, head of Gryffindor House, deputy headmistress, two-time member of the Order of the Phoenix, and a diehard Quidditch fan. Minerva McGonagall is one of the most respected and accomplished magic users in the Harry Potter series. She consistently demonstrates how essential her presence is to the narrative, to Hogwarts, and to Harry. Yet, she is all but ignored in most literary analyses of the series and of its characters which is a bit of a puzzling oversight when you consider how valued she is by Harry and other members of the series. If her exemplary abilities and achievements within Hogwarts and the greater wizarding world are not enough, then surely her relationship with the series titular character merits a deeper look. Harry finds care and affection in a select few, Hagrid, Remus Lupin, Sirius Black, and Dumbledore. A single witch, Molly Weasley, is allowed into the fold of parental figures most often cited uh, in studies of the text. Um, but McGonagall, who is head of Harry's house and the adult who would logically interact with Harry the most on a day-to-day -day basis, is written off and largely ignored. Why is it difficult for readers or scholars, all of you in this room, to recognize McGonagall's pivotal role? As the stern matron with a heart of gold, McGonagall may simply be fulfilling her stereotype. Yet for Harry, her role is anything but expected. Because he is the boy who lived, he inspires polemical responses, from great love and admiration to hate and loathing. To have a teacher treat him as they would any other student is kind of a singular experience, and one he never fully appreciates until the second half of the series. So the novels place most, if not all, the tension in the plot on the interactions between adults and children, and we talked about that a little bit before more so than between magic and muggle, good and evil. Yet uh, the well-meaning witches and wizards who seek to protect and watch over Harry do so with complicated intent. Hagrid, the first parental figure to appear, is literally larger than life for Harry, and so outside the realm of his muggle experience that the half-giant becomes the stand-in for everything that is magical and good. Hagrid is the one who not only rescues Harry from the Dursleys, but who admonishes them both verbally and magically, enacting a justice that Harry has certainly longed for. Harry continues to repay that first kindness, visiting Hagrid at his home and cheering him up when he's down, as any good friend would do. Hagrid, however, takes advantage of Harry's friendship often, and in ways that would be suspect between peers, but that become downright coercive between an adult and a child. Not only are Hagrid's requests of Harry inappropriate, they are often both irresponsible and dangerous. As early as Sorcerer's Stone, Hagrid, an adult, fully capable of rational action and of taking responsibility for the consequences of those actions, puts Harry and Hermione in a compromising position. Having illegally acquired a dragon egg and subsequently hatching a Norwegian Ridgeback in his wooden house, it is not Harry or Hagrid who acknowledges the danger, both physically and legally, of his actions, but the 11-year-old who seemed to be his only friends. It is then left to Harry and Hermione to clean up Hagrid's mistake. Young readers of the series are happy to keep Harry at the center of the action, thrilled by the rule-breaking and mischievous use of the invisibility cloak to sneak Norbert up to the astronomy tower. As readers age, however, and return to the text, the concerning implications begin to supersede the adventure itself. Yet we love Hagrid as Harry loves Hagrid. Though he may be a bit of a bumbling oaf at times, he cares about Harry, and so we forgive him his faults. We assume, because of his genial obtuseness, that the possible risks to Harry are unintended. The same cannot be said of Albus Dumbledore. While Dumbledore displays a certain favoritism and clear affection towards Harry throughout the series, Harry acknowledges in Deathly Hallows that he hardly knew Dumbledore at all. We, like Harry, fall under the spell of his benevolence his twinkling eyes, and kind attention bookending each of the earlier books. So that it is only when we look back that we realize that Dumbledore and Harry actually rarely interact until Half-Blood Prince. Their brief conversations before the Mirror of Erised and in the hospital wing following Quirrell's attack amount to little more than half an hour's time. 
Yet Harry holds on to these moments, cherishing and amplifying them. Much has already been said on the subject of Dumbledore's ambiguous moral compass, of his master plan to defeat Voldemort, centering on the sacrifice of a young boy, and so his position as an unimpeachable father figure has already been somewhat diminished over the years. Juxtaposed with Hagrid's bumbling endangerment of Harry, Dumbledore's actions are made under the guise of affection and care, exploiting the earnest trust and loyalty from Harry that Dumbledore has spent many years cultivating. For the purpose of this argument, the most pressing offense from Dumbledore is that he intentionally places Harry in danger. After it is suggested that Dumbledore intended for Harry to go beneath the trapdoor and face off against Quirrell Voldemort, Hermione exploded. If he did, I mean to say, that's terrible. You could have been killed. No, it isn't, said Harry thoughtfully. He's a funny man, Dumbledore. I think he sort of wanted to give me a chance. I think he knows more or less everything that goes on here, you know. I reckon he had a pretty good idea we were going to try. And instead of stopping us, he taught us just enough to help. I don't think it was an accident he let me find out how the mirror worked. It's almost like he thought I had the right to face Voldemort if I could. From the first novel, we see both Dumbledore's careful positioning of Harry within the plot and Harry's earnest, earnest interpretation of that behavior. This is not a tricky translation in ancient runes. Uh, Dumbledore is giving an 11-year-old boy a chance to sneak past a massive three-headed dog, narrowly avoid strangulation by Devil's Snare, beheading by a transfigured chess piece, and poisoning by a poorly reasoned choice of potion, because he thought Harry had the right to try. If Harry's assertion in this moment is correct, that Dumbledore knows more or less what goes on at Hogwarts, the headmaster's actions are at best cavalier and at worst calculated. As a guardian, Molly Weasley is far from this cavalier. She's established in the first book as a surrogate mother to Harry. In that regard, Molly's failings as a protector come from perhaps the best intentions, those of maternal care and love. By Prisoner of Azkaban, however, it is already clear that trouble has a way of finding Harry. Withheld information and half-truths do not protect him. They put him at risk. As the focal point of both a prophecy and a Dark Lord's vengeance, Harry's adolescence isn't comparable to Ron's or anyone else's. Some, like Sirius and at times Lupin, take Molly's position to the extreme opposite. If Harry is not a normal child, then he must be an adult. And these opposing viewpoints come to a head in the Order of the Phoenix. Sirius insists he's not a child, and while Molly often forgets that Harry is on his way to adulthood, she is the only one bold enough to point out that Harry is not James, and the adults responsible for him should not forget it. Though the presence of each of these adults fluctuates depending on the book, all of them have their parental roles acknowledged explicitly within the text. The manner of their care for Harry is superseded by the depth of it, allowing for the numerous indiscretions mentioned previously. Yet McGonagall, reserved and measured in her regard, constant in her attention and care, cannot claim that textual parental space, even though she does the most to deserve it. <laughs> it should come as no surprise that McGonagall's first appearance in the series should coincide with Harry's, just as she initiates 11-year-old Harry's first contact with the wizarding world via his Hogwarts letter, it is also McGonagall who watches over the infant Harry's delivery into the hands of his only muggle relatives. McGonagall spends hours observing the Dursleys, a reasonable precaution, and her protestations to Dumbledore's indifference are immediate and fierce. You don't mean, you can't mean the people who live here, cried Professor McGonagall, jumping to her feet and pointing at number four. Dumbledore, you can't. I've been watching them all day. You couldn't find two people who are less like us. Though she trusts Dumbledore, and by extension, the information that he alone is privy to, she fears for Harry, all but insisting that whatever Dumbledore's reasons, they cannot be sufficient to counteract the abuse that she has already foreseen. At Hogwarts, McGonagall consistently sees Harry as he is. A first year with a talent for Quidditch, a fifth year who could be a great auror given the right guidance. Though Harry and Ron both harbor brief hopes that she will favor Gryffindors as Snape favors Slytherin House, she quickly corrects their thinking. If anything, McGonagall appears to hold Gryffindors to a higher standard than the other houses and is the first to mete out detentions or lost points for rule breaking. The Norbert incident, for example, results in a loss of 50 points each for Harry, Hermione, and Neville when they are caught by McGonagall who justifies the massive deduction by saying, I have never been more ashamed of Gryffindor students. Though Harry is in fact a child, McGonagall never condescends to him. She tells him what she can, when she can, and in accordance with his experiences and maturity level. 
And then she expects him to act accordingly. She doesn't lie about the sorcerer's stone when confronted, but assures them no one can possibly steal it, it's too well protected. The following year, when Harry returns from slaying the basilisk that has been slumbering beneath the school for decades, Professor Dumbledore was standing by the mantelpiece beaming, next to Professor McGonagall, who was taking great steadying gasps, clutching her chest, <laughs> reacting appropriately to the sight of a 12-year-old brandishing a bloody sword. <laughs> from age 11 to 14, Harry is thrust into danger and troubling situations with almost formulaic consistency, because they're novels. And his reactive responses are typical of an adolescent. Without the necessary knowledge, children rely on instincts and emotions to navigate new or difficult situations. Harry, kept in the dark for so long about his past and the wizarding world, initially has only those instincts to rely on. And while those gut feelings quite often prove to be right, his successes have the detrimental effect of reinforcing that behavior. Dumbledore encourages Harry to rely on his instincts, but McGonagall encourages, even insists upon, calm and reason. When Harry and Ron encounter a sealed platform nine and three quarters in Chamber of Secrets, they panic, steal the enchanted Ford Anglia, and take off, all in the span of 10 minutes, to predictably disastrous results. Arriving at Hogwarts, the pair is confronted by McGonagall, and when she points out that they could have very easily owled Hogwarts, rather than drive a flying car over Britain, Harry gaped at her. Now she said it, that seemed the obvious thing to have done. I, I, I didn't think, he stammered. McGonagall, however, is unrelenting. That, she says, is obvious. <laughs> McGonagall repeatedly challenges Harry's recklessness, demanding to know, what on earth were you thinking of? Demanding that he think, period. As the tone of the series shifts between books four and five, the relationship between Harry and McGonagall undergoes a similar shift towards maturity. In the wake of Umbridge's takeover of Hogwarts, McGonagall becomes the bastion against ministerial interference and Harry's stalwart defender. No longer the short-sighted 11-year-old, Harry cannot ignore the consequences of his actions. There is no excuse for rash behavior because 15-year-old Harry knows better. McGonagall makes sure he knows better. Having a biscuit with her after a nasty exchange with Umbridge, Harry expresses his surprise at not being further punished for talking back to the headmistress. McGonagall, openly frustrated with him, responds, Potter, use your common sense. You know where she comes from. You must know to whom she is reporting. And she tempers her usual brusque manner with a caution to be careful. It is left to McGonagall to show Harry how to navigate a wizarding world that is no longer as simple as it was in Sorcerer's Stone. It is her job to teach him when to act and when to wait, a skill that becomes invaluable in the final book. McGonagall is the first to point out that if Harry wishes to continue to her newts in her courses, he'll need to work hard to scrape up the necessary exceeds expectations. She won't accept him on name alone. Yet, when Umbridge intends to blacklist Harry at the ministry simply because of who he is, McGonagall will not stand for it. Nothing can stop Umbridge from employing a theory-only based DADA, nor can McGonagall override Harry's OWL results to ensure he's eligible for the Aura program. Yet, if it is his goal to become an Aura, there is still something she can do. She can teach. I will assist you to become an Aura if it is the last thing I do. If I have to coach you nightly, I will make sure you achieve the required results. McGonagall seeks to arm Harry with the skills that will not only outlast Umbridge's administration, but that will also protect him from the singular dangers that await him. And Harry knows what supporting him costs those around him, and he, in turn, protects McGonagall. Each time he serves detention with Umbridge and the scar I must not tell lies is carved deeper, his friends insist he tell McGonagall. She'd go nuts if she knew. Harry knows this is true, yet he refuses again and again because how long do you reckon it would take Umbridge to pass another decree saying anyone who complains about the High Inquisitor gets sacked? It is not just a selfless act, to which Harry is already prone, but an intentional one. He knows more than Ron and Hermione do, the myriad of consequences involved in each of his actions. Having learned from McGonagall that the immediate threat is not always the most perilous, Harry has determined, is determined that to risk McGonagall's removal from Hogwarts would be to risk the loss of the school's best protector. McGonagall fulfills that role throughout the next two books, and when Harry is reunited with her, hidden at first beneath the invisibility cloak, it is to bear witness to her resistance. Why would Harry Potter try to get inside Ravenclaw Tower? Potter belongs to my house, McGonagall demands, summoned by the Carrows reports of having got Potter. McGonagall has never stated her fondness for Harry so explicitly. 
and it's unlikely that she would ever have knowingly done so in his presence. Yet as soon as she says it, readers know it's true. Beneath the disbelief and anger, Harry heard a little strain of pride in her voice, an affection for Minerva McGonagall gushed up inside him. Confronted with the truth he's always been aware of yet never heard, cements something foundational in Harry. McGonagall, irascible and inflexible perhaps, was and had always been, from that first night on the Dursley's doorstep, dependably, solidly present. At the end of seven novels, we know Harry's character, his graces, and his flaws. We know because we have been with him since the beginning that he feels deeply and acts sometimes rashly, but always for the sake of the people around him. It is not surprising that he breaks cover to defend McGonagall during the confrontation in Ravenclaw Tower. The manner of his defense, however, is essential. Amicus spat in her face. Harry pulled the cloak off himself, raised his wand, and said, you shouldn't have done that. As Amicus spun around, Harry shouted, Crucio. The Death Eater was lifted off his feet. He writhed through the air like a drowning man, thrashing and howling in pain, and then with a crunch and a shattering of glass, he smashed into the front of a bookcase and crumpled insensible to the floor. I see what Bellatrix meant, said Harry, the blood thundering through his brain. You need to really mean it. While it is demonstrated in Goblet of Fire that even 14-year-old school children are capable of mustering a passable imperious curse, the remaining unforgivables take a great deal more intention. Not even in his grief and anger minutes after Sirius Black's death can Harry successfully cast the Cruciatus curse on his murder of Bellatrix Lestrange. Not after Dumbledore's murder does Harry have the nerves or the ability to curse Severus Snape. When faced with Voldemort, Harry consistently and notoriously employs the disarming charm, refusing to blast people out of his way just because they're there, as the Dark Lord would. But with every hero, there's a line that should never be crossed. For Harry, that line is disrespecting Minerva McGonagall. <laughs> this is the only time in the seven book series when he successfully deploys a Cruciatus curse. There is a line from McGonagall as well. When Dumbledore dies, she is visibly shaken but resolved, taking charge of the Order and of Hogwarts. When the castle is besieged, she is steel, organizing the evacuation of the students with crisp efficiency and leading the defense of the school herself. Yet there are some things that not even McGonagall can bear. And when Hagrid emerges from the forest in Deathly Hallows, carrying a seemingly dead Harry, she is the first to react. No. The scream was the more terrible because he had never expected or dreamed that Professor McGonagall could make such a sound. He heard another woman laughing nearby and knew that Bellatrix gloried in McGonagall's despair. Readers know Harry is alive and one step closer to defeating Voldemort. But still engulfed by his shocking resurrection, we forget that only Narcissa Malfoy knows the truth. To the resistance, their symbol, the Chosen One, has fallen. To McGonagall, a 17-year-old boy, her student in charge for the last seven years, has been murdered, and she has failed to protect him. In this moment, the depth of the relationship at last laid bare is unquestionable. Not only is McGonagall's unwavering strength a touchstone for Harry throughout the series, but the same strength is an example for readers who feel lost or thwarted in challenging times. She sees Harry as he is, a young wizard with a terrible burden. And while she would prefer he never confront Voldemort again, she doesn't let her wishes interfere with reality. Instead, she makes sure that Harry is prepared for what is coming, including the ability to discern which battles are to be fought and which are better avoided. Can we imagine Harry succeeding in Deathly Hallows if those lessons hadn't been carefully and intentionally taught? As impulsive as his actions may seem during his hunt for the Horcruxes, they are nothing compared to the actions of an 11-year-old boy who, convinced his potions professor was evil, jumped down a trap door without a second thought. McGonagall is more responsible than any other adult for Harry's transition from impetuous child to discerning adult. And to underplay her role in the series does this complex character a grave disservice. Thank you.